Hey folks, this is Pastor Mike, and you're listening to our Wednesday night Bible study online. We hope you enjoy this, and you can hear more of our sermons and teachings at www.visitbethelchurch.org. God bless you, and have a great day. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. We're going to learn foundational truths tonight, and they're foundational truths because, uh, number one, that's what the book of Genesis is. It is a foundational book in the Bible. It is at the very beginning, and we read this book and we study it, and upon that is built the framework of knowledge and understanding from the rest of the Scripture. And um, I had uh, somebody call me this week, and, and uh, she was... Uh, I, I, I could tell you your testimony. It was a fantastic testimony. But she has been has been born again for a few years now. And uh, you'd have to kind of know her past a little bit to understand where she was coming from. But she was kind of confused on an issue about, you know, uh, her, I think it was her son or something like that had said that, you know, they were telling him in school that the that the earth was, you know, millions of years old and that, the, the Chinese could trace their history back 10,000 years old, and yet she heard somebody talk about creation and how it was only the Bible said the universe was only 6,000 years old. And she said, I don't understand that. And I said, well, number one, we always take the Bible, number one. And I told her about the genealogies and, and how the Bible was an accurate record of that. And I told her a little bit of, of time frames in the Bible, you know, six days and then the seventh day. And I just kind of taught her a little bit. And, boy, I'll tell you what, the light just went on in her soul. And she just almost started crying. She said, praise God. I mean, she got it. The, found, the foundational truths of this Bible is that we are created by God. We're not, we were not monkeys four million years ago. Amen. We were created by God. And God does have the answers to everything and every issue in life in this book. He has the answers to it. Things that we learned that we haven't seen yet, but I, I can tell you, according to scriptures, think these are things that we are going to see. So anyway, enough blabber by Mike Hoggard. Let's get into the Word of God. Genesis chapter 18. The Lord, I want you to notice this, the Lord appeared unto him. Who is this? Talking about Abraham. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Okay, now... We're, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this particular part of it. I will just tell you that in your King James, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, who does that denote? What does that denote there? It's, it's the name Jehovah in the Hebrew, but we know that it's Jesus. This is a situation where Jesus, God, made an appearance uh, to man on the earth. Okay? And um, he looked like a human. He looked like a, a human male, looked like a man. Okay, But this is before he became flesh. At this time, he is all spirit. Okay, But even at that, this is, this is part of what we're going to learn tonight. We're going to learn about angels. Okay, We're going to learn, this is angelology. This is the doctrine of angels. Um, who they are, what they are, what they do, what they're not supposed to do, what some of them did that they weren't supposed to do, and so on and so on. We're going to learn these things uh, probably over the next couple of Wednesday nights because it, it's just that deep. And I didn't dig out every single scrap of material from the Bible on angels and how they work. I didn't do that, uh, but I am covering a lot of highlights for our understanding. So here we have Jesus, who is Jehovah. Something that I tried to convince Brady of for several years, and now he gets it. Amen? Jesus, wait, wait till all these Jehovah's Witnesses find out that the one they've been calling Jehovah was the one they didn't believe in. Amen? He is Jehovah. Somebody say amen. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre and sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So here is Abraham. He sort of, and I want you to kind of get this image here. He is, he is sitting in the tent door. Why? It's the heat of the day. It's too hot in the tent. And it's too hot out in the sun. So he's kind of in the shade of the doorway of the tent. Okay? Don't want to go in the tent because it's way too hot in there. So he's kind of sitting in the shade of the doorway of the tent in the heat of the day. And it says, lo, three men stood by him. There were three men here. Okay, And one of those men 
was Jesus before his incarnation. The other two men, and let's go ahead and identify them, because we know that these, we find out later on in Genesis 18, that these two men with the Lord are sent ahead to go to Sodom. And so, in Genesis 19, verse 1, it says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even. So the Bible is defining for you who these men are. First of all, these were angels. And, and I'm going to give you, in fact, let me, let me ask you this. Who can identify the three orders of angels from the Bible? There's three of them. There are seraphim. Cherubim and men. Okay? These angels have the appearance of ordinary men. Alright? Does everybody follow that? Okay? Seraphs do not and cherubs do not. And that's part of... We're going to go to scriptures here in a little bit and understand the difference. So there are three... And there's possibly a fourth group of angels that if we get time tonight we'll look into okay you know i've been telling you that there are no female angels in the bible i'm going to retract that because in the book of i think it's zechariah and i got my notes here no they're not good they're i, I can't i'm telling you they're not good all right so anyway, but anyway, so we have, we have three men here. We know one of them is the Lord. So that leaves us with two of these men. They are men, masculine, normal, ordinary men in their appearance. And they're there with Jesus. These are angels. Now, does anybody know what the word angel means? What does it mean? Messenger, very good. It's a Greek word, angelos, which sip in, in that literally means messenger. So, and if you look, if you look at all the places where these men show up, they are generally showing up to be the messengers. Okay? So here in um, Genesis 18 and 19, these men show up and they have a message. Okay? The message that they're carrying is they're carrying to Lot and their message is, Get out of Sodom. The clock is ticking. Okay? That's their message. Uh, can somebody name another angel? In fact, he's one of three angels actually named in the Bible. Can anybody name those three angels? Michael. Gabriel. This always throws everybody. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Okay. Three angels mentioned by name in the scriptures. Okay. Now, Gabriel was a messenger angel. That's what, that's what he did. So he shows up and uh, he delivers a message, I believe, to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. Then he delivers a message to Mary. Gabriel is the one who proclaimed to Mary that she had already conceived by the Holy Ghost and she was going to give birth to the Christ child. So, and Gabriel appeared as a man, as a normal man, okay? And um, there's another place in the Bible we're going to kind of go through that, all right? So we mentioned the, the three characteristics of angels. Uh, we mentioned those that are men. We mentioned the seraphim. In fact, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. This is the only place in the Bible that I could find that uh, is mentioning uh, seraphs specifically by name, and uh, I, I don't, I don't have total, complete, full, absolute, perfect knowledge of this. But according to what I see, I could only find two angels that are characterized as seraphs or seraphim. Okay, I could only find two of them, and they're here, right here in Isaiah chapter six. There might be more, but I see two of them right here. Isaiah chapter six. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it, he's talking about the throne, above it stood the seraphims. Okay, now this is plural here, so you know there's more than one. As above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, notice the masculine wording here. He. 
With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another. Okay, so that kind of tells me that there's two standing here over the throne of God. And they cry one to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, who are the hosts? Host is a, is a King James Bible term for the angels. Okay, the army of God is the, angel, is the angelic army. Who is the captain? Um, well, we know the captain of the host, the, the captain of the host is Jesus Christ. Okay, but who is directly under Jesus in this little army that God has? It would be Michael, because that's when we see in Revelation 12, we see the devil and his angels fighting and Michael and his angels prevail. Okay, so Michael is that, and by the way, he's the prince of, of God's people according to the book of Daniel. He's a, he's a soul, he, listen, Michael's not a messenger. Okay, he's a soldier. Amen. When Michael shows up, the fight's fixing to start. Amen. Now, Gabriel, he seems to be more sophisticated than that. Gabriel just says, I just have a uh, candy gram for Mary. Okay. I mean, that's who, that's who Gabriel is. All right. But Michael is fierce. He is a warrior. Okay. So anyway, here we have uh, the seraphs. And they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. I like this, because when you start measuring yourself up against the glory of Almighty God, you will say, I am not, I should not be here. Amen. I am undone. He said, I am un, a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, I like this because God is going to give a man of unclean lips. He's going to give a man who is unclean, unrighteous, a sinner just like you and I. He's going to give him a calling in his life. Verse 6, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. And he said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. How many things are purged with heat? Amen. If, you've, if, you're, out, if you're out following Bear grills out through the wilderness, and he digs up water from somewhere, what's the best thing to do with that water? Boil that water. Amen. Boil that stuff and purge. He purges those things. And so anyway, so these seraphs show up right here. And to my knowledge, you don't really see them any other place except right here in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. All right. So that is, that is more or less what the Bible tells you is their ministry. In other words, their job is to stand over the, um, the throne of God and to basically say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Okay, so that's, that's their position. Then we get into the cherubs or the cherubim. Now there is many, many references in the Bible to cherubs. And um, let's see here. I want us to go to... Uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's look at what their responsibility is. Hebrews chapter 9. There are two cherubs, and they also are in attendance uh, to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9, and I picked this verse because there was probably 20 or 30 verses in the Old Testament that basically said this same thing, so I'm using this one out of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5. The Bible says, uh, and over it, he's talking about the... Um, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant in verse 4, and it says over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. God had told Moses, he said, I want you to build this Ark of the Covenant unto me, and then on this Ark, I want you to, I want you to build uh, two, uh, two cherubs, two angels, and I want their wings to sort of go over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. 
They are, they are referred to in the Bible as covering cherubs. They are covering the throne of God. Okay, they're standing there and there's two of them. So here we have God who all through the Old Testament is talking about sitting on his throne uh, surrounded by these two cherubs. Okay, does everybody get that idea so far? Uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Let's get an idea of their appearance. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now you will see, clearly see, a difference between the men angels that we have been talking about so far and, and these cherubs. Um, and I'll just point out to you very quickly, and you, if you want to write this down, it, when, in Ezekiel chapter 1, on a little side note there, write Ezekiel 10. Because you'll go to Ezekiel 10 and you find out that they are called cherubs in Ezekiel 10. And in verse, and in Ezekiel chapter 1, they're called living creatures. Okay? But they're the same thing. When you read Ezekiel 10 and read Ezekiel 1, you'll see that it's talking about the same thing because Ezekiel said, these are the ones that I saw in the previous vision. And that is Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, so in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5, here is the likeness of these cherubs. Also out of the midst of the, uh, thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this is their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. So far as we know, these men angels that showed up as messengers did not have wings. Okay? Because they just simply appeared as men is what they appeared as. Okay? Now I'm going to ask you a question. I'll throw you, throw you a little curveball here. Okay? These angels that showed up to talk to Abraham, did they have feet? Did they have a mouth? Did they have teeth? How do we know? We're going to find out. We're going to find out. Don't, don't, don't spoil it for me, Wayne. Everybody here knows you're in the seventh grade and these people are only in the sixth grade, okay? No. He just got held back a year. That's all right, you know. <laughs> okay? So anyway, the, the, the appearance of these cherubs is different than the men angel messengers that we see throughout the scriptures. Okay, so everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. Now I'm sure you know some people with two faces. Amen? Yeah. Okay, know a few people like that. But anyway, and their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like unto the sole of a calf's foot. That doesn't look like a man to me. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they, had, uh, and they four had their faces and their wings. And their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion. And on the right side, and they, had, they four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. And they went and it, so apparently these cherubs only have four wings, whereas the seraphs had, what we say, six wings. OK. Uh, those would probably be real good in buffalo sauce. Amen. Boy, I'm just I'm taking a lot of chances tonight. Amen. OK. Uh, verse 12. And they went every one straight forward, whither the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and, and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Um, I have a book. And I remember reading this book when I was in um, all around 5th, 6th, 7th grade, something like that. It's called Chariots of the Gods. It's written by a, uh, I think he's Swedish or something like that, or Dutch or something, er Eric Von Daniken. And Eric Von Daniken is one of these guys, he, he won't believe the Bible. He absolutely refuses to believe the Bible, but he'll believe all these other mythical accounts from history. And he says that these four living creatures and this God in Ezekiel chapter 1, that really Ezekiel is describing a, a UFO, a spaceship, okay? 
the wheels. When he starts talking about the wheels and the wheels, he's, you know, you see these flying saucers and they look like wheels. Some of them probably are. Okay? Um, and so anyway, he just refuses. But these are actually an order of angels called cherubs or the cherubim. And this is their appearance. Now, we cannot, in three-dimensional flesh and blood, bodies and minds and eyes, we cannot fully grasp the appearance of these spiritual creatures. But they do appear, and they are real. Okay. Now, one of the things, and I don't think I took a note on this, and I think, it was, I, think it was, I was going to, and I just ran out of time was I was going to talk, in fact, I have a place here where I was going to talk about spirit bodies from the Bible, and I didn't write any scriptures down, but I will, um, is we need to understand how the Bible describes a spirit body. Don't believe Hollywood and TV land and Cartoon Network when it comes to understanding a ghost, a geist, or a spirit of some kind. Don't believe the television, okay? Because Hollywood has given us this idea of a ghost as this shapeless mist, okay? That when you go to swing through it, you just go right through it, okay? Um, they're giving you a false idea of a spirit. There was a movie came out called Ghost. Probably some of you saw it, okay? Patrick Swayze. And it gave an entire... Number one, the whole thing was a false, 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 false gospel. Okay? Because it basically said, good people who are in love go to heaven. Okay? And really, 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 really bad people go to hell. Okay? And so, that's a false gospel. But it gave a false impression of a spirit body. Okay, uh, Patrick Swayze had problems moving things because he would just slip right through it. Okay, that is not what this Bible teaches. Okay, it is not a biblical concept. A spirit body is a real body. It has a form, and I will show you that probably next Wednesday if I remember. I will show you the scripture that tells you that spirit bodies have a form. Okay? And some people some people have said, well, you know, when the Bible they when they when they look like men, they I've had people say, well, that's just how they appear. That's not how they really were. Well, number one, that's not in the Bible. That's a that's a guess. Okay? The Bible says they were men. Didn't say that they appeared as men. It said they were men. But we also know them to be angels. And so that is an order of angels in that these had the body and the form of men. Okay? Um, in fact, let me go to this very quickly while I'm on it. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Have you ever seen an angel? And I don't mean... Your sweetie pie when you first laid, eye, laid eyes on her. Okay? What, what was this? Uh, somebody, uh, one of these pickup lines. Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? Come on. <laughs> By the way, if you ever dating somebody that fell from heaven, you need to get out of that relationship. Amen? <laughs> Amen? Okay. <laughs> That's not a good thing, all right? Yeah. Aren't you glad you'll be the Bible? Say amen. Uh, Hebrews 13, 2. In fact, Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Okay? He said angels here. And Paul had, was teaching that he's telling you, be nice to people. Be nice to people. Brotherly love. Let it continue. And be not forgetful to entertain strangers. That guy that was walking down the road. Okay. That you thought was just a bum. Who might it have been? Well, it might have been Charles Manson. You just never know. Okay. 
But I, I believe that angels, I believe they appear. And I believe that you could possibly have entertained one unaware. Why? And it's not that before you showed up, they had, quick, tuck your wings in. Okay? They, these particular angels have the form, the fashion, the shape, the body of men. A spirit body, but a body just the same. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? It's kind of hard for us to grasp, but that is what the scriptures are telling us. All right? Now, um, let's see here. Uh, we talked about the cherubims and, oh, 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 Ezekiel 28. Man, I don't want to forget that one. Because we mentioned the three angels given by name in the scriptures. One was Gabriel, and one was Michael. And what do those two names have in common? The letter L. Actually, the letter's E-L. And that always denotes God's name. El, Elohim. Okay? Now we're in Ezekiel 28, and we are looking at um, a, the prince of Tyrus. A prince is an earthly person, and it is a principality. Okay? A prince of, Ty, a prince of Tyrus in verse 1. And then in um, verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum of full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is, this is Lucifer, the anointed cherub. Number one, he is full of wisdom. Don't think that you'll be able to outsmart the devil because he is wiser than Daniel, he says at the beginning of this chapter. Okay. Number two, he is perfect in beauty. Okay. Absolutely perfect in in beauty. Now verse 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So we and we know Lucifer was in the garden of God. He was the serpent. Every precious stone was I covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, and emerald, and carbuncle and gold. What does this tell you? The devil loves bling. Amen. He's probably got gold teeth. Amen. So he is full of these precious, precious metals and, and uh, precious stones and so on. And notice verse 13, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes. What does that mean? Music. He, I'm telling you, and I cannot emphasize this enough, he knows Music. He knows rhythms. He knows tones. He knows harmonics. He knows wavelengths. He knows dissonance and resonance. He knows more about music than the greatest musical minds ever walked this planet. He knows how to use music. He knows how to do it. I mentioned earlier about something that came across my desk here a while back. Something that is really starting to go through these kids is called eye doping. Eye doping. These kids, and I, well, I hate to even mention it, but these kids are going on the internet and they're, they're listening to this music that is specifically created to generate a high, a chemical high. And some of these kids are addicted to the tones that they're hearing in their, in their earbuds or their headphones or whatever it is. They're addicted to it. It's almost like uh, there's a kind of music called trance music. Guess what it's for? Okay? And so this eye, this eye doping is an electronic method of these people are getting hooked into this music and it's actually generating feelings inside of them. Is it possible? Pay attention to the next movie or the next TV show or the next commercial that you watch. Pay attention to just the music. Okay? And you will see that it has an effect. The devil knows how to use tones, chord changes, everything. But he is a master of repetition. He's a master of repetition. How many of these pop songs 
just repeated over and over. We, we go to Taco Bell and they play this stuff in there. And that's what, that's what sticks out in my mind the most is when they get toward the end of the song, it's a constant repetition of a theme, a constant repetition of the theme. And Jesus warned us about that and said, don't do it. Don't do it. Okay? Anyway, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. In other words, this was not just an afterthought. This was actually part of his physical being. Tabrets, which is percussive instruments, and pipes, which provides melody, harmony, and, and so on. Okay? And so they were prepared in thee in the day that thou was. See, this is the prob this is the thing that the devil has the biggest problem with. In the day that thou wast created. He has a real big problem with that one. Because he is the created, not the creator. Okay? And so we look at the beginning of the chapter of Ezekiel and he says, I, I want to be God. I want to sit in the seat of God. Well, listen, Mr. Lucifer, if you want to be God, start creating something. Amen? Okay? Uh, by the way, the Bible does not attribute creative ability to angels that I've seen. I may be wrong, but I have not seen evidence that the Bible attributes the ability to create something out of nothing to angels. And we know that angels have power and might, but I don't see that they have creative power and might. Okay? And if I'm wrong, you know, then, um, you know, it won't be the first time. All right? Now, verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, here's, here's, I, I like this. Currently, there are two cherubs that covereth the throne of God. I think, according to this, at one time, there was one. The anointed cherub that covereth by himself. He was there perfect in beauty. The word Lucifer, literally meaning bearing the light, the bearer of the light. Okay? That's why the moon is a significant symbol of Lucifer. He does not have his own light. The moon does not have its own light. It is a reflection of the sun. Okay? And so anyway, he is the Lucifer. He is the anointed cherub that covereth. He is perfect in beauty and his music coming out. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou, wast, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Here it is, another hang up he has. Till iniquity was found in thee. And that iniquity, Isaiah 14 tells us, was pride. It was pride. Isaiah 14 tells us that. Um, so anyway, I won't, I won't go in. Uh, oh, oh, no, actually, verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, and I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now, I want you to, here's another interesting point about Lucifer. He has wisdom, but his pride has corrupted his wisdom. And I will tell you that the devil knows every word of the Bible. But the corruption that comes in because of his pride says, I don't believe it. I think it can be broken. That's his pride. That's the corruption. Okay? When I, when I talk about Bible numbers and symbols, okay, God uses numbers all throughout the Bible. No doubt in my mind about it. And I wouldn't study numbers for a long time because I thought, man, that's like the occult, man. I won't touch it. But God showed me that he uses numbers. But so does the devil. The New Age movement, the numerology, witchcraft uses... I mean, all of the mystery, uh, occult, sex in the world use numbers, but they're occulted. They are corrupted. They are the exact opposite. Whereas the number 13 represents the pure love of God. Because here you have 12 disciples and you have Jesus. How many is that? 13, and he is the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The charity chapter in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 13. And yet here we have, that's the pure love of God. And then we have a harlot love. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's her number. And it's the exact opposite. God's pure love gives. Harlot love takes. See the difference? Okay, and so anyway, 
So at one time, this anointed cherub was perfect. But then his pride corrupted him. And so according to the scripture, what physical appearance does Lucifer have? He wasn't a man. He never had the appearance of a man. Since he is a cherub, then he has the appearance of a beast. Okay? In Revelation chapter 4, mirrors Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel calls them living creatures. John calls them beasts. So he has the appearance of a beast. He is always described as a serpent, a dragon, okay, a leviathan, which is a sea creature. He breathes fire, because that's what the Bible says he does. Okay? And everybody says, oh, you just believe myths. No, I just believe the Bible. Okay? And that's his appearance. Okay? Um, it looks to me like and when he was in the Garden of Eden, he had legs. Okay? But then after the curse, they were cut off of him, and he, had, he was cursed to crawl on his belly. Okay? And so that's the appearance of Lucifer. He does not, he is not this man with a pitchfork in his hand and a little arrow tail. And hooves, okay? That's not him. Okay? He has the appearance of a cherub, which means he has a beast appearance, which means also he has a beast nature. He's he has an animal nature to him that he cannot he cannot override, he cannot escape. He, he does not he cannot choose. To do right. He cannot choose to do right. Just as God cannot do evil, Lucifer cannot do good. Okay? Don't let anybody tell you any different. He cannot choose. By the way, another thing that we know about angels is that they cannot be redeemed. Okay? They cannot be redeemed. That's why angels cannot sing redeemed. They cannot sing this song. Because they cannot be redeemed. God does not allow them that option. Alright, now very quickly, we've got a few minutes tonight. And I want to, I want to get into this uh, very quickly. Um, Job chapter 4 verse 18. Let's look at just a few scriptures tonight. Of just of, of verses concerning angels, and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't know how many. I got a bunch of them here. We'll go through a few tonight. Go through a few uh, next Wednesday night. Uh, Job chapter four, um, verse eighteen. The Bible says, "Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels." I want you to look at the exact language here. His angels he charged with folly. Okay, his angels he charged with folly. We, and we're, we're eventually going to go back a little bit to Genesis 6 and kind of cover some ground there just so that everybody understands. But apparently from the scriptures, and we're going to get more light on this as we move along, there was a group of angels that committed a crime. Okay, When you're charged with a crime, uh, I, had to, uh, I reported for jury duty um, Monday. And uh, there was a young man there that had been charged by the, by the county of Jefferson, by the state of Missouri. He had been charged with a crime. It, it was um, first degree assault and armed criminal action. Okay? And uh, they didn't select me on the jury, but I would like to have been a part of that because the greatest thing, the greatest thing that we still have left in this country that makes us a great nation is a jury trial. I don't think you understand that. But the government cannot just charge and convict people by themselves. Our founders wrote in that a person who is charged with a crime must face a jury of his peers. Twelve people, and they all have to vote the same way in order for, for the conviction to stand or be taken away. And I think that is, when you stop and think about that, that is the neatest thing that we have in this world is that we as citizens of this country cannot just be accused and convicted by the government. The government can lay out its case, but it's 12 ordinary people that can decide yay or nay. We still are the people. 
Amen. As long as we have that, we still have power in this country. Aren't you glad somebody say amen? But the Bible says his angels, he charged with a folly. And so God charged these angels with a crime. Now, when someone is charged with a crime, what happens? They're arrested. When they're charged with a crime, they're arrested and they're taken to jail. And they're held in jail until the trial. Okay, so I want you to understand that because that is what is going to take place in the last days. There are angels right now that have been charged with a crime. That charge was folly. Now, if you chase that word folly throughout the scriptures, you'll see that it's being used as a word that denotes adultery and fornication. Okay, when David's son laid in bed acting like he was sick, waiting for his sister to come in the room so he could rape her. And when he was fixing to rape her, his own sister, she said, do not commit this folly before all Israel. Okay, that's the same word being used here. God charged them with the crime of folly. Um, Psalm 68. This I thought, and I just discovered this today, and I thought this was a really, really, really neat verse. Who in here, who in here, uh, just a simple question, okay? Who in here, believe, and when I say this word, understand the truest sense of the meaning. Who in here believes in unidentified flying objects? And I will raise my hand. I believe in them. Okay? I will tell you that I don't believe that they are aliens from the planet Pluto. Amen. Okay? That for some reason they can fly 4 billion light years through space and then crash in Roswell, New Mexico. For some reason they can't quite stick the landing. Okay? I mean, they're really good at flying. They just can't land very well. Okay? So I don't believe that part of it. But I believe, and I want you to, I like this, because when I saw this, I'm going, it makes sense. Okay? I believe that, that there are unidentified flying objects that have a natural explanation for that, and I believe that. There are, however, too many documented, photographed, and videoed cases where there are objects in the sky that are doing things that are unnatural according to the laws that we know and they are unidentified okay how far you go with that i mean that's your business but i will tell you that we're constantly bombarded with television shows tv movie, movies and everything else that's telling us that the aliens are going to land i think it's a, there's a movie coming out in november called skyline and you ought to see, I mean, I watched, I watched the trailer to this thing on YouTube, and I could just point to you the verses of Scripture that this two minutes of this trailer was based on. Okay? Absolutely blew me away. Okay? But what are these flying saucers? What are they? They themselves, if you look at this, Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands of what? What is that word? Are we in the same verse here? Psalm 68 verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands of what? What are the chariots of God? They're angels. And Von Daniken wrote his book called Chariots of the Gods. And he doesn't realize how close he is to the truth. Because these chariots are in fact angels. Okay? Angels, fallen angels. Okay? That's the chariots of God. Throw that in there. Psalm 78. Who created Lucifer? Who created Lucifer? God did. Did God, Bradley, at the time that he created Lucifer... Um, didn't Mormon doctrine teach that him and Jesus were brothers? Man. Um, and that there was, there was like a, um, a discussion in heaven over who's going to be the Savior. And Lucifer said, I'll do it. <sighs> okay. It was martini glass in his hand. And God said, no, I'm going to pick my son Jesus. And Lucifer got mad. And that's, what that started. that's Mormon doctrine, right? Okay. Did God know that Lucifer was going to fall when he created him? Absolutely. Just like God knew, Jesus knew Judas. Before he was born, Jesus knew Judas. Okay? So, did, does God create evil angels? Yes. 
Okay? So look at this verse here. And then this is the last one for tonight. Psalm 78, 49. Uh, the Bible says, He cast them upon the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Evil angels, they're up at the throne room of God. And God uses them and dispatches them for his purposes and his for his work. And I'll give you an example. In the days of, of Ahab, Ahab and I think who was it? Hezekiah uh, or Jehoshaphat, one of the two. But anyway, um, Ahab was going to go to war. And Ahab, and I think it was Hezekiah, and I get the two mixed up. But one of the kings of Judah went and said, uh, can we hear from the Lord on this? And Ahab said, oh, that's easy. I got 400, eight, uh, 400 prophets that are on the take. And I'll just ask them. And so we asked the 400 prophets and they said, Oh yeah, oh God showed us that you're going to get the great victory, old King Ahab. You know, that's only $43.95 now. Guess okay. And so Hezekiah said, I don't think so. Isn't there anybody who can speak for the Lord? And Ahab said, Yeah, there's this one guy and I hate him. Because he never says anything good about me. And so the king of Judah said, let's go get him. So he came in, the prophet came in and said, I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me. I saw a vision of heaven and God in heaven surrounded by all these angels. And God said, who will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab? And one old angel said, I'll do it. I'll do it. I know exactly. I'm good at this. I spend my existence being a lying spirit in the mouth of preachers. How many of you believe that's true? Say amen. amen. And that's what, and God said, go do it. And that evil angel obeyed God. Even Lucifer, who was full of pride in Job chapter 1 and 2, obeyed God. I, I, I'm going to go after Job. You can touch his body, can't take his, or you can touch his property, you can't touch his body. Lucifer obeyed. Job chapter 2. You can touch his body, you cannot take his life. And Lucifer consented unto that. He obeyed. Lucifer does not have more power than God. And Lucifer knows exactly where the pit is. And he'll know that he gets thrown in there the moment he doesn't do what God tells him to do. So stop and think about this. The greatest, one of the greatest agents of God's work on this earth is Lucifer. Okay? Because people should have a choice on who they're going to serve. Amen? And you can only have a choice if you have the opposites here.